this morning what I want to do is talk about the British Raj or the period of time in which the uh, the time after the East India Company but I actually want to overlap a little bit I want to step back and talk some more about the British growth in control in India which included the East India Company and then talk more specifically about the revolt of 1857 where uh, sometimes called the, the Sepoy Revolt uh, or mute, Sepoy Mutiny. Sepoy was the word for a, an Indian in British military service or the service of the East India Company um, pr prior to the foundation of the Raj. And so um, this rebellion is critically important in terms of understanding a lot about why Britain considered uh, India so critically important to them and why they didn't just after the 57 revolt why didn't they just leave because the the value they had but uh, this map which we looked at yesterday originally there had been various the portuguese the french the dutch uh, and the british even the danish in various colonies around here well by the time the british east india company really took charge there were they controlled all of india um, with the, the, the minor exceptions of some cities like Goa, a Goa city and a little bit of the Goa region, which the Portuguese held control of. And then on the uh, east coast of India, there were a couple of cities, including Pondicherry, for instance, that were French controlled and, and remained French controlled until the 1950s. So this is what it looked like in the um, early 1700s, mid 1700s in terms of the pink being the area that were completely controlled by the British East India Company. Later on, after the British East India Company, when we get to the end of the 19th century, you end up with much more land having been taken over by the uh, East India Company. Now, remembering that in 1750, when this map on the left would sort of been the situation, the British East India Company had only 3,000 regular troops. They were primarily guards for uh, center cities and whatnot. Uh, they started out in the first century between 1600 and 1700 primarily being concerned about developing trade. But starting around 1700 or so, and then 1750s reflected that, they began to acquire property by force of arms. They became, it seems, uh, where the British, British East Indian Company, in case you weren't in my talks about this, they were a commercial uh, company that was chartered and approved of by first Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth I in 1600, and then later on really grew and developed and developed, but they stopped being just a commercial interest. They were, they were chartered so that they could have their own military troops to protect. They, they could mint their own um, coinage. They could arrest and convict and even execute criminals. So they had most of the basic rights and responsibilities that a government would have. And over a period of time, they started taking that so seriously that the uh, by 1857, the British East India Company had 280,000 men in their military. They had a navy, um, they were, ex and that's twice as many soldiers as there were in the regular British Army. So they were a major military force and they had become the imperial power that was running all of India. Um, Unfortunately, they were running India. It, it, we talked some yesterday as well about the fact that, yesterday, day before yesterday, yeah, we were on land yesterday. Uh, day before yesterday about the fact there was a lot of uh, sense of priority that the white man was so much better than the various uh, people in what they considered more primitive parts of the world, that they not only had a right, but a, in some cases they thought a responsibility to try to civilize the people of India as they later did Africa and other places. And so there was very much this sense of racial superiority. And some of the things that created the problems that led up to the 1857 revolt, there was really overt racial discrimination. Indians were not allowed to ever have authority over any British um, people. They could not serve as officers. There really was not respect for the, the local native rulers. and. Even though the British East India Company was in, in charge of most of the country, they still had princes, that is royal princes, Indian princes, who were, while they had to report to the British, they were still responsible for their areas. M many of those areas had been hereditary 
passed down from their ancestors. And yet there was no respect for these people. Um, there was no access to promotion or privilege beyond a certain very limited point for Indians, and no Indians were allowed in civil service. Now, there was a lot of kind of uh, sleight of hand that went on, where the British would claim equality. For instance, they said, well, any Indian who wants to become part of the Indian civil service, which was the government employees, not the military, but the government employees, that wants to be participate in the Indian civil service, all they have to do is take the training, which means the Indian would have to pay to go to England and pay all the expenses to attend the academy that had been set up uh, in England to train civil servants and then take the civil service exam. Well, no Indians could really afford that, at least none that wanted to be involved in the civil service, and the civil service was a, was a real prime job for uh, the British, they really wanted those jobs. They were well paid, they were secure. Um, later on, when there were some epidemics and things, a lot of those folks ended up dying in India, but at first it was really thought of as being the way to go. And yet Indians simply, while well, technically they could have become part of the civil service, they couldn't practically because of the restrictions put on it. So racial discrimination was one of the problems. Secondly, there was the expansion of British military control by extreme methods. In some cases, they simply took land away from people, but often, again, there was sort of a sleight of hand. Um, the English Governor General, for instance, the British Governor General, established what he called the Doctrine of Lapse. The Doctrine of Lapse said that any prince, remember these princes still controlled a lot of the area, in fact, that's why you see areas like um, um, Hyderabad and Mysore and Rajputana that are not formally considered under control of the British because there were princes that controlled those. Well, any prince that did not have a biological male heir was considered um, that when that prince died, the East India Company just took the land. It came under the control of the East India Company. Or if um, they ever deemed, and this was entirely subjective, they got to decide if they ever deemed that a ruler was not uh, competent, then they had policy that said they could just take their land. And they used that, the doctrine of lapse. I'm going to give you a story in a few minutes about the, the queen of an uh, area called Jansi, that they did exactly that. They simply waited for her older husband to die. He had an adopted son. The British had, it appeared, approved the descent to his son and that his wife would continue to rule the kingdom until her death. And after he died, they just said, nope, doctrine of lapse, we're taking all your land away from you. So um, they did a lot of that sort of thing. There, so the third thing was there was an overt British effort to change the Indian culture. Now, some of the things we look at and we go, well, of course they were trying to stop that. Sati which was the Indian uh, historic tradition of widows being burned on the pyre with their husbands. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of us would think that was a good idea, but it was an important part of Indian culture that the British simply said you can't do it anymore. Child brides, the fact that in, in Indian culture, uh, widows could not remarry. The, the British were passing laws against all of these things. And uh, most especially, the period of time in the, um, 1840s and uh, 50s was the major growth in Great Britain of the Protestant evangelical movement. This is the heyday of Charles Spurgeon, who was considered the, the you know the 19th century Billy Graham of England. He had a huge uh, congregation following. So there was a huge spurt of growth in Protestant evangelicalism, and that included missionary efforts. And so Protestant missionaries, Christian missionaries, were coming to India. They were being allowed to preach in the barracks and in the refectories and other places so that the, the Indians, Hindus and Muslims, had to listen to them. It was, it was required. And frequently they weren't just trying to convert the Hindus and Muslims to Christianity, but they were being very vocal about how horrendous they thought those religions were, how awful Hinduism was, and um, how you know, terrible and, and ungodly Islam was. And these Indians were being forced to listen to this, and they developed this idea that the British eventually were going to try to force them to convert. And so there was this constant tension uh, underneath as to where was this all going. The fourth thing is this was a period of very significant famines and epidemics. Some of the famines, as I mentioned the other day, were because the British were controlling what the people grew. They would force them to grow cotton, 
or even opium to sell to China um, rather than grow grain. And so even after the end of the British East India Company, when the British Crown took over the governance of India, there were 10 major famines, including, for instance, the 1876-77 Great Famine, the 1899-1900 India Famine, each of which claimed, it's estimated, as many as 10 million lives, some of the worst famines in human history. And much of this was seen as the fault of the British control and what they allowed the people to do. Another reason for the revolt was pressure caused by the East India Company's financial problems. You'd think with all of the control that it would be a huge, and early on it was, a huge financial benefit to those people involved into the British Crown. Uh, but eventually they became very inefficient as, as they grew their army from 3,000 to 12,000 to 26,000 to 280,000. It costs a lot of money to maintain a standing army of 280,000 with everything that goes along with that. In fact, the army was always the highest expense both for the East India Company and then later for the British Crown in India when they were controlling it under the British Raj. Well, when they were running into financial problems, one of the things they had a tendency to do is cut the pay of Indian soldiers or just take away their bonuses, which had been promised to them. They didn't do that to the British soldiers, officers, but only to the Indians. And so there's this constant financial pressure, on top of which the British, of course, were taxing all these people. Um, they were, some of them being taxed to a significant uh, degree. And then the final straw, which I mentioned the other day, in 1856, uh, they introduced a new cartridge to go along with the 1853 Enfield rifle, which had been invented. It was supposed to uh, greatly increase the speed with which muzzle loaders could be fired, so that you have more, you have more firepower, you can get more bullets out there, then you're going to win more battles. Well, uh, the new cartridge came in in a greased, what appeared to be a greased wooden or a greased paper cartridge which was greased so that the gunpowder inside it wouldn't get wet. You bite off the end that has the bullet in it, you pour the gunpowder down the barrel, the muzzle of the gun, so that you're, and then you shove the paper in there, tamp it down, because that's the wadding, and then you spit the bullet into the barrel. Well, the problem was this greased paper, the rumor went around that the grease on it was either beef tallow or it was pig lard. Well, beef, the idea of putting it in your mouth to bite it off, beef tallow was completely uh, taboo to any Hindu, and pork lard was completely uh, taboo to any Muslim. And so 85% of the soldiers they initially presented with these cartridges refused to take them. Well, the British response to that was not very good. On May 10th of 1857 in Beirut, which is a, was a British uh, fortification, it was about 40 miles northeast of the old city of Delhi, not New Delhi. Um, when they started handing out these cartridges, and 85% of the sepoys, the uh, Indian soldiers, refused to take them, those who did refuse were immediately stripped of their uniforms. They were humiliated in front of uh, everyone present. They were uh, strapped in leg irons and summarily, without trial, um, sentenced to 10 years of hard labor in prison. Pretty harsh. Well, they put them in the stockade. That night, all of the other Indian soldiers decided that we've had enough of this. On top of all of these other things that caused this problem. And so that night, they broke their comrades out of the stockade. They killed all of the British officers and their families. And they began a revolt which spread all the way across northern India. Um, there were areas like the Punjab and uh, the Bengali area that did not participate in it. But they went down, again, it's only 40 miles away, they went down to Delhi. And in Delhi, the old Mughal emperor, who at this point was 81 years old, um, they took him and announced that he was now the new uh, emperor of Hindustan. They renamed the country and they were going to throw the British out. Well, the 81-year-old uh, Mughal ruler, Baladur Shah Zafar, was an opium addict. He was senile. Um, they had, without any power or authority, the British had allowed him to continue to live in the old fort in Delhi that he had lived in for a long time, and, um, but they made him the new, the, the new emperor and uh, sort of held him up 
that was the start of a major conflict. If all of the British, if all of the uh, Indian military in Britain had rebelled, then the British wouldn't have stood a chance because they were outnumbered more than three to one by the Sepoys over the British military that were there. But a lot of the Indian areas, as I say, the Punjab, which where many of the great Sikh soldiers came from, uh, the area of Bengal and others did not rebel. In fact, they supported the British in this rebellion and they sent more troops from uh, Britain to support them. Even so, it took from May 10th, all of 19, uh, or 1857 and most of 1858 to put down the rebellion. Um, there were some horrendous battles associated with this. By the way, this is finally the surrender or the capture or the whatever you would call it for Sina, old man, uh, of, the, of the man that had been the Mughal emperor who was renamed the emperor of the Hindustan. They even produced stamps about the Indian mutiny. It's sometimes called the Sepoy mutiny or the Indian revolt of 1857. Um, and there were various of other princes who supported the uh, one side or the other when they, those who supported the Indian side were imprisoned, deported, various other things afterwards. Well, the battles that occurred once they had the, um, the reinforcements that they needed, the British were able to put down the rebellion, although it took over a year. And when they finally put down the rebellion, um, their response was pretty horrendous. They executed anyone that they considered to have been involved in it actively. A lot of the people were just going along. Any of the leaders were executed um, without trial, without um, resort. And they did things like Muslims, before they were, uh, they were hanged or shot, they would be wrapped in pig skins and forced to drink, um, you know, to drink alcohol. The Hindus were forced to eat beef. Um, this was in order to take away any any sense of respect or for many of these, they felt like that was the committing of a sin that was a huge problem right before they were executed. And so there was, a, there was an effort to embarrass, to really demean, to, to make this an example. Uh, many of the leaders, and you see this down here, many of the leaders of the revolt were strapped in front of the barrels of cannons and blown apart which had been a, a, a method that the old Mughal emperors had used when, uh, for mutineers, and the British did it as well. It was really a horrendous suppression. Now, I mentioned this woman up here, whose name is Lakshmibai. She was the Rani of Jansi. Rani means queen. Raj is king, Rani is queen in Hindi. So, she was um, married as a 14-year-old to a much older Maharaja, uh, the Prince of Jansi, and he, um, she was very smart, very beautiful, very competent, everybody was very impressed with her. She had a child, but the child died. Her husband, before his death, adopted another son, which she, uh, she was involved with too, it wasn't against her will, and then before he died on his deathbed, he made out a document which said that his son would be treated, his adopted son would be treated with respect as the Prince of Jansi, and that his wife, um, Lakshmi Bai, she was named after the Hindu goddess of Lakshmi, uh, that, that Lakshmi Bai would continue to serve as the queen of Jansi until her death, and she would rule. The British officials accept, you know, they accepted it, took the document, and said fine. As soon as he died, they said, nope, according to the doctrine of laughs, this land now belongs to the British. You don't own it anymore. And they gave her, they said, we'll give you a stipend to live on, but you have to leave the palace and leave everything here. Well, she refused. Um, and she gathered troops around her, the guard that she had. She herself, you'll notice she's carrying a sword and has a shield here. She herself was leading the armed resistance to this. When the British finally attacked uh, the fortified city in Jhansi where she lived, she leapt from the walls on her favorite horse. Her horse died, she survived and escaped. She gathered other supporters around her and for most of the year of the rebellion, she was one of the most important of the leaders of the rebellion. Uh, she actually was leading the troops in battle, as well as encouraging others, uh, other princes and other leaders in India to join with her in, in repelling the English, driving them out. 
She finally, at the Battle of Gualador, almost all of her um, retainers, all of the people around her were killed. She was actually wearing, according to one story, a cavalry uniform. And, and, and when her horse was killed out from under her, she was fighting on foot, was wounded and had fallen, but was still trying to fight and finally was shot by one of the British Hussars. And so she died there. But even the British, while they, they, they said she was the most dangerous of all the rebellion leaders, and that they spoke of her in some positive terms, but said it's a good thing that she was not allowed to continue. So an extraordinary story, and she died when she was 30. So most of, of these activities, she was in her late 20s when she was leading all of this stuff. Again, this is, um, I bring this slide back up again because I want to talk about the results of all of that. I talked about the causes. The first result was after allowing it to happen and after then the way they responded, killing tens of thousands of people outright. Oh, and the other thing that they would do is there was a, in um, Kalapur, the city, a number of the women and children of the British families were massacred. There were, there were horrendous things done on both sides. Well, in Kalapur, when some of the, the room that these women and children were massacred in was blood soaked. And so they took some of the, the sepoys who had been arrested. They, uh, in addition to wrapping the Muslims in pigskin and forcing the Hindus to eat beef and all that kind of thing, they would force them to go in and clean up one part of the blood, which dealing with human blood, again, in both Muslim and Hindu uh, circles was considered um, a terrible thing to have to do. And then they would either hang them or shoot them. And so there really was an intentional kind of effort to degrade these folks. Um, but after all of that, the British Crown looked at what had happened, the fact that it was been allowed to happen, and also how the, the East India Company responded to it, and they revoked the charter for the East India Company. They nationalized the company, took it under control of the Crown. Um, it continued to act, this is in 1858, at the end, after the end of the rebellion. They continued, the East India Company continued a very small role in a couple of other places until 1873, when they had to pay out all of the value of any, any investments that people had in them, and they were formally done away with. Um, but they had a huge impact on, obviously, on India. Now, changes that were made. The British government, once they took over, they said, we can't do this this way again. So first, they, so they recognized that more communication and camaraderie was needed between the British and the Indians at all levels that there needed to be more interaction between the British troops, uh, the British officers and the Indian troops. There needed to be more interaction between the civilian communities that were there. One of the things that the British had a heartburn about was that a lot of the people that had rebelled against them had been beneficiaries of land reform, where they had taken land away from some of the Mughal rulers that had come before and given it to peasants. Well, those peasants that had been involved with the, with the sepoys in the rebellion. So they said, well, we're not gonna do that anymore. They don't seem to be grateful. But while they had no more land reform, no more land distribution, they also stopped seizing Indian land. They stopped uh, declaring the doctrine of lapse uh, as a way for them to take land. The, the leaders that had supported the British in the rebellion, they gave them greater independence. These became some of the princes who maintained their own authority. There were actually two categories under the British Raj. There was the direct British Raj, that the areas that were directly managed by the British, uh, British Crown. And then secondly, there were the princes who ran their own area, but then ultimately were under the, you know, the protectorate of the British. The Queen Victoria um, gave a speech and promised more equal opportunity in, to civil service. There was a uh, promise that there would be no more effort to change Indian culture. They basically decided it's not possible. The Indians are so, for so many centuries, have been so embedded in their cultural practices we can't try to change them anymore. So there were no more laws to try to change some of the things the Indians did and no more real concerted effort to, um, to enforce the laws that existed. And there was more religious tolerance. They removed the, you know, the berating of Muslims and Hindus and uh, gave them more freedom. And then finally, in order to try to make sure this didn't happen again, they increased the ratio of the number of British who were there to, um, to Sepoy, Indian. It had been three to one, three Indians for every one British officer. It was, it was changed to two to one. Hindu and Muslim um, divisions were separated. They were not intermingled anymore, and they were never allowed to serve near where their homes were. 
so that you wouldn't get some of that kind of rebellious um, response in the future. So this is the map that um, that we would be looking at in the mid 1800s in terms of the British Empire. All the areas in pink, you notice Canada is still up there, um, Australia, India, South Africa, various other smaller kind of uh, entities. So why is this talk called um, British India, The Jewel in the Crown? And why is that, do you all ever watch any of the BBC series, The Jewel in the Crown, which is about British India? Um, beautiful imagery, very well done, as most of the BBC things are. The Jewel in the Crown uh, for the British had previously been North America. Um, the, the colonies of America, because of all the natural resources they could bring out of there, tobacco, a lot of other things. That had been the most profitable and most important of their colonies. But a little something happened in 1776 that they lost America. Now, they retained Canada. How many Canadians do we have? Okay, what's the population of Canada now? 35 million. Well, it was a lot less than that in, you know, in the 1850s. And most of the population was right along the south. So uh, Canada simply didn't have a large enough population to, to be a huge deal for Britain. Australia, the same. Both of these later would become very important. But in the 1850s, after the India revol Revolt, India became the jewel in the crown because it was the source of so much of what the British needed. One, uh, it was a huge population, and the huge population was 300 million at that point. Um, the 300 million people in India could, one, be used as cheap labor, which was important to the British. Secondly, they were a huge market for British goods. And the British would actually, they, they controlled trade so that the primary, like like uh, cotton garments, finished finished clothing and things of that sort that were produced in, in Britain, they would not allow the Indians to produce those things. So they had to buy them from Great Britain. Um, they were a huge market. They also were uh, a huge population to be taxed. Now, taxes went down under the British Raj over what they had been uh, before, or under what they had been before, but still there was an enormous amount of money to be made from taxing them. It was a very important location because it was uh, in between China and some of the Far Eastern markets for opium, for instance. We talked about the fact that the British forced the Indians to grow opium, and when the Chinese said uh, opium is illegal, they then provided it to smugglers in India, sold it to smugglers in India, who smuggled it into China. And um, when China finally said smugglers who smuggle opium in are going to be uh, executed, the death penalty, then Britain fought two wars to insist to that they had the right to import opium, even though the government of China didn't want it. And they won those wars, so that they wait for opium to be taken into China. You've all seen the images movies or whatever of opium, Chinese opium dens, right? And people lying around semi-conscious smoking opium. Well, that's why the Chinese wanted to get rid of it, but the British were making a lot of money on it. In fact, the total amount of money they were spending to buy tea was offset by the amount of money they made from selling opium to China. And so they fought wars to keep doing that. But there were a lot of other things that they traded in China. And India was the perfect location as a, as a center point not just for British trade, but for everybody else. Because anyone who was going from, let's say, anywhere in Europe um, to China, they needed a center point that they could stop off, resupply, um, maybe sell goods, buy goods. Well, anybody who came into a port in India that was controlled by Britain, they got taxed on the value of what they had. So there was a lot of income coming in from, being, from taxation in that regard. Tariffs on goods that went through there. And then, of course, India's uh, was valuable for the extractive resources. Spices, textiles, raw cotton, opium, silk, tea, coffee, all of those kinds of things. And what you ended up with was this link where England would turn raw materials into finished goods and then send those goods to India for the 300 million people there to buy. India would send raw materials to England that could be used for creation and then purchase those goods. This map also, the arrow here, gives you a very good idea why several times uh, England or Britain has been willing to go to war in order to protect the Suez Canal. 
why before the First World War they had already taken over Egypt, which technically was still part of the Ottoman Empire, is because without the Suez Canal right here, which gave a link, you know, Straits of Gibraltar across the Mediterranean Sea through the Suez Canal, along the uh, Red Sea, out into the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea, and directly to the jewel in their crown, the most important of their, uh, of their territories, which was uh, India. And so that was critically important to them. And they went to war a number of times in order to protect that. This is the flag, then, of the British Raj. When the East India Company was folded up, all of India came under the direct control of the British Crown. And they, this was the flag for the British Raj, which was what they call Raj, uh, in, in Hindi means king, but in Hindustan, um, um, it means rule. Basically the same thing. And so, this was the, the flag for the British rule of India after the, the closing of the East India Company, the direct rule. It was ruled by, there was a general secretary or secretary general in London that was responsible for India, that was part of the government. He stayed in, in Britain. But then there was a viceroy. The word viceroy means an assistant to the, to the crown, assistant of the king. A viceroy of India, and between the viceroy who was on the ground in India and the uh, secretary general over India in London, they maintained the authority. In 1876, as you see here, Queen Victoria was named the Empress of India. Um, this, the image on the left here is Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister at the time and Queen Victoria's favorite prime minister ever. Um, she really liked him, and there's a question as to whether Disraeli did this in order to please uh, the Queen, or whether she sort of insisted on it, and he did it because she wanted it. But he, and she's, he's the idea of being an empress, um, here he is presenting the crown, and they, later on, Queen Victoria didn't go to England, but her grandson, George V, went. You remember the... Um, the discussion about they had an imperial visit from George V and his wife Mary. He was crowned in Delhi um, and actually in Calcutta. Uh, and they, they announced at that point that Delhi would be the new capital because it's more central. And they built the you know this huge arch in honor of it, although the arch wasn't built until like 20 years later. And so they, they had to create all new crown jewels for this because the crown jewels of England could not be taken out of England. They're not allowed to be removed even from the Tower of London unless they're being used for an official ceremony in England. But in order to do this, they had to create a whole new crown um, and, and other jewels, and I think it was 30,000 diamonds in the crown, you know, these huge stones, the Star of India, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. So, but th some people believe that the reason that Disraeli named Queen Victoria, the Empress of China, is because three years earlier, her cousin, who was the, uh, the Kaiser in Germany, they had formally put together the German Empire. The German Empire didn't, didn't last very long between its formation in the mid-1800s and the, its collapse in the First World War, but he had been named the Emperor, the Kaiser. And by the way, in Germany, the word Kaiser, in uh, Russia, the word Tsar, and the rulers of Russia were also related. In fact, eventually, the three rulers of, during the First World War, the rulers of England, of Germany, and of Russia were all cousins. They all had uh, Queen Victoria as their grandmother. The King of England said, if our grandmother had been alive, she would never have allowed the First World War to happen. But Kaiser and Tsar are both versions of the word Caesar, and they mean the emperor, the ultimate ruler. And so when he Disraeli gave the crown and named Victoria as the Empress of India. Some people believe it's because three years earlier her cousin had been made the Emperor of the new German Empire. And so it let her feel like, let her feel as though she were catching up or keeping up, maybe, that she was now an Empress as well. This image on the left here was a cartoon <coughs> which shows India being milked for all of the resources that that they can get out of it, which was very much sort of what was happening at that time. <clears throat>
The period of time between 1815 and 1914 has been called the imperial century for Britain. It was a period of time in which, in that one century, Great Britain added 10,000 square miles to their empire, and they added 400 million people to the areas that they controlled. And during that period of time, they, they, all of their rivals were defeated. In uh, Napoleon, once he was defeated, the only nation in the world that in any way could have challenged Britain, and they were actually much more primitive, was Russia. There were no other challengers. And so Britain became very much kind of the global policeman, the one that, that felt responsible for keeping everything in line. And that's one of the reasons they took such an imperialistic kind of uh, approach to India and to other places. This then is British India. British India is the expression that was used for uh, all of the territories and places within the Queen's Dominion that were directly governed by her. When they talked about India, they meant the places that were directly governed by the British, meaning they had their own governors and, and assistant governors in place, but then also all of the princes who still maintained direct authority over their, uh, their princely kingdoms, but then had to report to the, the British. So they had those two categories, the ones directly ruled by Britain and the ones indirectly ruled by Britain. And they referred to them as British India and India, respectively. Now, the question always continues as to uh, the benefits and negatives of the British having been in India, uh, especially during the Raj period. The, uh, one of the positives, or some of the positives we can see from this, is that the British produced railways, bridges, canals, roads, they installed telegraph. In fact, there were underwater telegraph uh, lines during the British Raj that were run all the way to London so that they could communicate. In fact, the role of the Viceroy on the ground in, in India ended up being much less important after the telegraph was installed because the Governor General, who was his boss, could make the decisions from London. They could communicate via the telegraph. They also had the largest irrigation system in India in the world, all built by the British. Now, the British engineers designed all this stuff. The Indian workers built them, but they were always built with British materials so that the British economy was benefited by all of the material that was used, all of the steel and everything else. But this is a list of the railway system, or a map of the railway systems throughout India that the British created. It was the fourth largest rail system in the world. And as I say that, the largest irrigation system in the world. They installed um, telegraphs. Here's an example of a bridge built, in a, a railway bridge built by the British. And some of you, when we were in, in Mumbai, you saw the, Victoria, uh, the Victoria Terminus, which is the spectacular building. It's considered one of the most beautiful railway stations in the world. The, the Indian name for it now is like three words, each of which has got 27 letters in it, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that. In fact, our, our guide made a joke about that. Nobody ever says, I want to go to the blah, 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 blah. They say, I want to go to the CTS or the Victoria Terminal still. So, uh, but they, it was extraordinary the kind of input that they had, the British, on India in terms of creating all this infrastructure. Much of this during the Second World War, for instance, all the rail system was very much used to, uh, to move soldiers, to move equipment, uh, became an, an excellent example of how the British Empire, by pouring money and expertise into a country like India, ended up gaining advantage for it. The main reason, though, I mean, it's nice to think that they it would be nice to have thought that they were doing this for, for philanthropic reasons. They wanted to help the Indians, so they put in uh, rail systems and all of that. But the primary reason for the rail system was because it was an efficient way for them to get the goods that were raised inland to the ports so that they could get then export them, or vice versa. The products that they brought in to sell could be taken in. As I mentioned, there was some economic benefit at this time because the taxation decreased on the citizens of India. Uh, they were not taxed as heavily as they had been under the East India Company, nor as heavily as they had been under the Mughals, even before the British got involved in it. So there continues to be a huge debate over how much, you know, what kind of impact the British had in India. How much of it was positive, how much of it was negative. There's some historians that say overall, because of the increase in literacy, uh, the use of, uh, because there are so many languages in India, the use of English by virtually everyone, um, the medical system, etc., the, the trains, the telegraph, all of the infrastructure they put in, 
that India in the long term benefited from that. And India is doing very well now and, and still using those resources. On the other hand, when you look at the, the famines that were created, primarily because of policies about what Indians were allowed to grow, the epidemics that were brought from the West that killed you know, a lot of Indian people as well as a number of the, the British, when you look at the uh, sort of imperialistic denigration of the free freedom and free will and in industrial capability of the Indians themselves, some people say that, it, that the British destroyed the potential of the Indian economy for, for 300 years. And that had they not been there, that India would have developed on their own to a much greater extent. But you also have to say that from the British, the Indians got parliamentary government. India has a parliament uh, now uh, in, in the same model as the British. The idea of one person, one vote would not have existed without the British influence probably. The idea of rule of law through nonpartisan courts. Previously, it was all, you know, the legal system was that the local ruler decided. And if he liked you, great. If he didn't like you, but the non, uh, the impartial nonpartisan rule of law through courts, the idea of district administration, creation of universities, creation of a stock exchange so that people can share in the purchase of, of companies. All of those are things that the British brought to India and that people look at. Most historians today, though, are pretty convinced that the existence of the British India, first and especially the Far East, uh, the East India Company, and then later under the Raj, India ended up being more limited than benefited from those things. But historians will fist fight over that one because how do we know for sure what, what might have been, okay? Any questions? about any of that, this important period. And by the way, I didn't touch on an independence. I will pick that up in the next talk we do, which is Gandhi and this, the Indian struggle for independence. Yes? I seem to have read many years ago uh, when I studied some of this that the transition from the uh, British East Indian Company was controlled to the British Raj uh, was still controlled to a great extent by people that were in place prior. In other words, under the Raj, people were in place that had been in place before. I'm not talking about somebody at the very top, right. but I'm talking about throughout throughout the organization, particularly militarily and, and administratively. Therefore, many of the same attitudes and approaches were, shall we say, perpetuated right. into the period of the Raj for quite some time and actually didn't really end until the independence of India. Do right. you have some comments? Yeah, on? so his comment is that he had read that when East India Company was nationalized um, and came under the crown and the British Raj was put in place, that a lot of the same people were still in charge. They simply were no longer working with East India Company, they now work directly for the crown. Um, and that therefore a lot of the attitudes did not change. And that's true. Um, in fact, the uh, Corzon, Lord Corzon, who was in charge prior to the collapse of the East India Company, continued for a while as the Governor General um, and others in that position. So, uh, and Corzon was actually the, quite enlightened. You know, he, he, he did some blind things. You know, he, at one point he, for instance, decided he was going to separate uh, the province of Bengal divided in two, East Bengal and West Bengal, and based upon Muslim versus uh, Hindu. And he did it without asking any of the Indians what they wanted. And it was a huge kerfuffle. In fact, that, that sort of was a precursor to the eventual conflict uh, between Pakistan and India at the time of independence. So, but overall, he actually seemed to have the best interest in, in mind. So. What you're saying is true. There were a lot of people that stayed in place. They didn't replace the Far East India Company. They nationalized it. They put it under the control of the crown. And so there were some attitudes still. But because the crown was involved, they dictated some changes in what was going on uh, in terms of the nature of the relationships, in terms of no more uh, taking of land through the, you know, the idea of lapse, and some of the other things. So they did change policies, but they couldn't change all the attitudes, no. You're absolutely right. And so there was still 
there was still a racist sort of underpinning to this, as there always is in imperialism. Again, when I, when I study this history every once in a while, I sit back in my chair and go, who did those people think they were that they would march in and plant their flag and say this now belongs to us when there were already people there? Okay, and yet it happened all the time. It happened in India. So, yeah, th those kind of attitudes, the attitudes of superiority, you know, the white, the, the British even developed this idea that they were so much superior and trying to make it sound good, um, they wrote about the white man's burden. If you're familiar with that term, the white man's burden basically is that since we obviously are superior, in every way imaginable, then we have the responsibility to try to take these poor primitive people and lift them up to make them better than they are. They'll never be as good as us, is the assumption, but to try to make them better than they are. That was the white man's burden. And so yes, that attitude prevailed um, up until independence. Yes? I have a comment and a question. Having listened to you, I think what the British were, what the international terrorists were. Okay. Right. Uh, his comment was that his view is that the British were international terrorists, and, and there are a lot of historians who would say the same thing, by the way. That's not unusual. As I say, th they have fistfights over this about, well, you know, would they have been worse off if they hadn't had all the infrastructure that the British bought, brought versus they, it was basically an extractive, you know, resource kind of thing, uh, relationship. So has there been any fair reparation? I am not aware of any. Um, and I think partly because India is, has done very, very well. I mean, they, the Green Revolution, you know, the, the gate has in, improved their ability to feed themselves in the 70s from that point on. I mean, I can, I can remember when I was young hearing about the famine. India was sort of a, um, a symbol of the places in the world where people didn't have enough to eat. Well, that's no longer the concept. That's no longer kind of the, the idea that people have. So I'm not aware of any efforts to try to achieve reparation. I think one of the reasons is that because through the whole process of independence, because independence, getting independence from Britain was hard enough, the fact that it happened at the same time that there was a major civil war, or at least a war between the new country of Pakistan and you know, with 12 million uh, displaced people, refugees, two million people uh, disappeared and assumed dead, that there were other big problems. And once they finally got rid of the British, I don't think they wanted to open that can of worms again in terms of, okay, you owe us something. Now, that's my own assumption, but I don't have any data to support that. Yes? Um, there was a, a uh, they sent in a general, General Campbell, who was uh, originally Scottish, he was a Highlander troop, and he took command, and he was quite ruthless. Again, they, they, he was the one that sort of led them in the execution of, of rebels when they, when they uh, captured them and that sort of thing. Uh, there were others that were involved. There was a general, a Dyer, in the Punjab. He had issued, because of, this is a, the start of all of this, uh, led to what was called the Amritsar Massacre where um, there was a major Sikh holiday that was coming, and the holiday called for Sikhs to get together, you know, and, and celebrate in groups. Well, he, fearing that this was, there was a problem, and the Punjab did not suffer greatly from the rebellion. Most of the, most of the Punjabi uh, citizens supported the British, or at least stayed out of it. Well, because this General Dyer issued an order, which apparently was not very well communicated, that there were to be no gatherings in public at the same time, Sikhs from, uh, and Amritsar is the holy city of the Sikhs, that's where the Golden Temple is. Sikhs from all the surrounding area in the Punjab came into Amritsar for the celebrations, not having even heard that there was, um, they had closed everything down and that nobody was supposed to gather. There was, there was a strict, um, that's what I'm looking for. Curfew? Curfew. 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 <laughs> um, and so all these people, Many of the people gathered, in a lot of them in a square that had walls all the way around it. They were like five, five gates. And he blocked one of the gates with a, an armored vehicle and ordered his soldiers to open fire on this unarmed crowd with machine guns and rifles. They had machine guns back then. And um, the estimates vary. The lowest estimate is that 339 of these civilians were killed and more than 1,000 wounded. 
Some estimates say that more than a thousand were killed and several thousand wounded because they were stuck in this area and they were all running for the gates and he instructed his soldiers to shoot at the gates so that as the people were trying to escape, some people jumped into a well that was in this, this big courtyard area um, and it, it was horrendous. Well, because of the mutiny was happening, he, Dyer, received um, a commendation from the House of Lords. And the general opinion in Britain was that he'd done a great thing. Now, the House of Commons censured him, but um, people raised funds for him so that he eventually was cashiered out of the military, censured, but no action was ever taken against him beyond that. And when he got back to England, they gave him a big bunch of money they gathered for him. Um, which, okay, so there were horrendous things happening in that time, but the generals, like, like the reason that they, they sent uh, the General Campbell in from outside is because um, they wanted somebody they thought would be ruthless, and it didn't appear as though the uh, East India Company officers were being strong enough, ruthless enough, whatever, and so they sent people in from outside for the most part. Question. Yes. I am very curious to know, they have all this independence all these years, they are independent. What they do for this country, like what I saw, they don't wash their buildings. Why the reason and why they are doing what it was built from the British? Well, the, the idea that they don't watch their buildings, that's purely a cultural thing. They don't focus on the outside, they focus on the inside, okay? And that's not, that's not a, a symbol of the fact that they're not progressive. India today has the sixth largest economy in the world, if I'm remembering correctly, it's right up there. Um, they are very successful, very independent, a major world trading power, and all of that has come just in the last 65 years. Um, 60. 64 years or something like that, something. I'm not adding it up right now. But the idea is that given their independence and all that they had to struggle through at the point in which they got the independence, including a major civil war and continuing conflict, you have to realize that India has Pakistan on one side that doesn't like them, you know, and there's always a threat, and both Pakistan and India are nuclear powers. They both have nuclear weapons. Sri Lanka is not real keen on them, although they're not a major threat to them. They felt like, uh, in some cases, the Tamil um, rebellion was supported by India in ways. There's questions about that. And then they've got India, uh, China on one side, and China is not their friend. And so India is in kind of a precarious situation geographically. Given all of that, they have done phenomenally well. Their economy is sound. They don't suffer from. Uh, they. Prior to 1970, they still had problem with people being undernourished, undernourished famine. Um, they have greatly increased their literacy. Their education system is very well, you know, very well developed. Um, India is doing really well, okay. And I think we need to give them credit for that. So the fact that they don't wash the outside of their buildings is the fact that that's just not a priority for them. You know, um, I I don't understand why young men wear their pants down around their knees either, but that's a cultural thing. Okay? It doesn't mean they're evil or that they don't know what they're doing. It's just a different decision. Yes? Um, India is the largest market in the world. It is. So uh, what he said is true, and, and that is India is the largest democracy in the world. Um, and we sometimes miss that. They're, they're the most populous democracy on the planet. There has been friction. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's some friction between countries always if they are nuclear powers. You know, we the friction that we've often had between India, with India, and we being the US, with India or with Pakistan, is because they both are nuclear powers, we feel probably an inordinate or maybe not even unnecessary responsibility to try to convince them to act in certain ways, which sovereign nations aren't real keen on that. And so, to some extent, I, I mentioned the fact that the, great, that the British um, in the 19th century took on the role as uh, global policemen. Um, well, the US, to some extent, not as much, but to some extent has done that in recent years. 
So we end up having strained relationship with countries that, because we want to make them do certain things, you know, out of fear that there, there might be a nuclear war that would break out in the Indian subcontinent, we try to get them to do certain things. And if they don't want to do them, then there's pressure. And there's the brinksmanship and all of that. I think that's a lot of it. Um, I don't think, you know, they are a democracy. Uh, we don't have any problem with the way they run their democracy. They're, they're not those kinds of reasons. I think it's just the fear of what might happen in this part of the world um, if somebody loses control and there are nuclear weapons involved. And so we, the U.S. feels a responsibility. And I think some of this comes from the fact that we're the ones that invented nuclear weapons. So we've always felt some responsibility about that. And so I think that comes into it. Yes? Um, just that really, it seems then that I've heard in the past that the British had a lot to do with um, pushing in the caste system and to the extent that they perpetuated it and to how much it really has diminished today. Right, so the caste system. Um, there is a difference of opinion. Again, it's one of the other things that, that uh, historians and sociologists will argue about as to whether the British encouraged the caste system in terms of who they hired into what jobs, basically. That they tried to follow the caste system, and if they did that, was it simply because the reality was that you're in charge of a country that the, the population is much greater than yours, you know, if you're British, uh, then you take somebody from the Shudras class, uh, or even low Shudras, the untouchables, and you put them in a position where they have authority over other Indians who are of a different caste, and you're, you're creating a, you know, a powder keg there. And so how much of that was necessary in order to try to maintain order, how much of it was intentional in, to, in order to try to suppress people, uh, how much it was just accidental. There are other people who say that the British actually tried to do away with that in terms of opening up what, op what limited opportunities there were for Indians to other classes, uh, other castes. And so, um, you know, the, the caste system technically is illegal in India now for somebody to be evaluated based upon whether they're Shudra's class or whatever. Um, but the caste, the British had to struggle with the caste system. You know, they, uh, we talk about the revolt of 1857. There was a prior revolt in 1820 in the Punjab, where they didn't have trouble later. And the reason was the British, the, one of the Anglo-Burmese wars, when we were fighting, uh, the English were trying to take over Burma. Well, other, there are other factors there. But they wanted to ship the Sikh soldiers that were part of the British uh, forces in 1820, East, East Indian Com uh, Company, they were gonna send them by ship to Burma. Well, in the caste system, if you travel across an ocean or large water, doesn't rivers don't count, but if you cross water like that, you lose your caste status. Well, almost all of the people who were part of the Sikh uh, military forces, the Sepoys, were upper caste. If they had gone by ship to Burma, they would all of a sudden have lost any social status they had. And so they rebelled. It was not nearly as big, it wasn't as big a deal. They, they put it down pretty ruthlessly. They executed a lot of people for that. But that's just one example of the fact that the British struggled with the caste system. It's not a simple question of, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, so, yeah, uh, whether they encouraged it, allowed it, tried to suppress it, huge question. Now today in India, even though the caste system is formally, you cannot, you cannot be biased based upon caste, the fact is that underneath the official, there is still a lot of prejudice. You know, just like there are prejudices, the civil rights movement in the United States obviously didn't remove all prejudice from people, even though legally it's not acceptable anymore. I think the same thing is true in the caste system in India. So. Okay, right here, Marsha. Could you not also make an argument that the class system at that time in Britain paralleled the caste system in India to some degree? Right, that, the, that perhaps the British had their own caste system. You know, that you, you had to, you had to be of a certain uh, level in order to take positions. I think I mentioned that prior to the, the East India Company, late in their, in their tenure, they actually changed this. Prior to their system, which the British government later adopted, um, if you wanted to be an officer of the military, you bought it, you paid for it. You had to be wealthy, in other words, in order to be in a position of authority in the military or in, in anything else. And so obviously there was a caste system there. Question over here, yes. 
Has there been any attempt to control population in India? Has there been in China? I'm not aware of any governmental, like in China, they made it illegal to have more than one child. And now they're trying to backtrack on that because it's come back to bite them. I'm not aware of any, any uh, legal or any governmental requirements in India. I know there have been some population control um, efforts, voluntary kinds of things that have been encouraged, but I'm not aware of any, any uh, forceful or governmental programs. Thank you all very much. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about Gandhi and the struggle for Indian independence.